So we've been working our way through a series of messages. By the way, thank you, Amy, for speaking last week. You did a wonderful job. And didn't she do a good job? We're all blessed. And I appreciate it. We had a good time uh, celebrating Kelly's birthday in Nashville, and it was nice to be away, but to also know that, that, that y'all will be worshiping here. So, um, but we, we, I've been speaking on the, who are we? You know, what is our identity? And we've looked at what our identity as Christians is, but also what our identity as individuals. And we've been looking at the idea of what it means. Why are we, why do we call ourselves Methodist? And what does that mean as Christians? What does it mean to be a Methodist? Well, uh, I didn't grow up as a Methodist, grew up in the Baptist church and became a Methodist uh, when I was 18. Um, as a matter of fact, I was just thinking about it. Uh, Abigail was driving me in the car the other day and Kelly and I started dating when uh, Kelly was about Abigail's age. She was 16. I think she'd just 16 and a couple of months old when we started dating. And that's when I became a Methodist. Um, and when I first was, uh, the first time I asked somebody, I said, what's the difference between Methodist and Baptist? And somebody told me a joke. They said, well, you know what the difference between a Methodist and a Baptist is? Methodists say hello to each other when they see each other in the liquor store. And, uh, and I thought, okay, well, and that's true, that's true. Uh, uh, not that Baptists don't go to the liquor store, they just don't say hello to each other. But, um, you know, what is, it, what is the real difference? It, it, we think about things like, well, we sing this hymn, or we sing that way, or we light Advent candles in the service, or, you know, we, we, um, we say the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer. We're more liturgical, and that's the things that we see that look different, but really what it, our identity as Methodists goes deeper than that. It, it really goes down to our distinctive emphasis about God's grace. All Christians believe in, and emphasize God's grace because that's what saves us. We, we're saved by God's grace, not by any good thing that we do. It's by God's grace. But in the Methodist way of looking at it, we, we really look at three, how God's grace is experienced in three different ways. And we've talked about how God's prevenient grace is working on our behalf before we're even aware of it. Even when there were those little twin babies in the NICU, God is working on their behalf. Even before they know about God, you know, have the mental capacity to know about God. God works for us. And then at some point, we, we come to a an experience of understanding and awareness of God's saving grace. And we choose to follow grace and God justifies us with his justifying grace. He saves us, but it doesn't stop there. And this is where Methodist emphasis really comes in. We emphasize the sanctifying grace of God that works on us for the rest of our life on earth. In the United Methodist hymnal, uh, this is a great hymnal. Even though it's getting kind of old, it was, it was published in the 80s. And back when Amy Grant, you remember when she was a, like popular and they put Amy Grant's, one of her songs in here and everybody thought it was cool and now it's like an old song <laughs> from the 80s. But it's a really good hymnal. It's organized well. And one of the resources that they have in it, at the top of every page, they list the theme of that song, and it's organized that way. So for instance, 367 says, is he touched me? And the theme of that song is justifying grace. And so there are justifying grace, and there's prevenient grace, and there's healing, and all those kinds of things. Well, in the United Methodist hymnal, 22 songs are listed under the theme of prevenient grace. 20 songs are listed under the theme of justifying grace. But get this. 154 songs are listed under the theme of sanctifying grace. 22, 20, and then 154. So you can see that in our tradition, what we really, really emphasize eight times almost as much uh, as the other is sanctifying grace. What does that tell you about what we, we emphasize? Sanctification is a fancy word that means it is the lifelong process of God healing us of sin and perfecting us in love. True healing comes 
as we surrender ourselves to God and let his grace transform us. Healing comes as we obey and do those things that God asks of us. A man who is sick, not sick with like a cold, but you know, a man who's really sick with something that he can't get over on his own. So he has to go to a doctor in order to get better, right? He has to follow the doctor's treatment plan. Now, it doesn't matter if he goes to the best doctor in the whole world, like the number one rated doctor in the world. Well, if he doesn't do what the doctor tells him to do, it won't matter. He has to do what the doctor says in order to get better. And we can think of our spiritual life in that way as well. Jesus is the great physician. He's the greatest spiritual healer of all times. But if you don't do what he asks you to do, you won't get better. It doesn't matter that he's the greatest physician. Well, I want to talk about that today. So let's look at Romans chapter 6 and verses 12 through 18. It says, Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourself completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master. For you, are no, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? Of course not. Don't you realize that you become a slave of whatever you choose to obey? And you can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Thank God, once you were slaves to sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want to point out a few key phrases in this reading. In verse 14, it says, sin is no longer your master. You are free by God's grace. And then in verse 15, it says, since God's grace has set you free from the law, does that mean that we can go on sinning? Of course not. And so this, these, these two verses are, are pointing out to us that when God saves us, then sin is no longer our master. We've been set free. We don't just go on living like we did before God saved. Something has changed and something is changing in us. We have a new direction, a new purpose. God wants us to be holy. Here's some more scriptures that show that God wants us to become holy. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, it says, It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. And then in Jude chapter 1, verse uh, 24, it says, all glory to God, who is able to keep you from stumbling and who will bring you into his glorious presence, innocent of sin and with great joy. And here's some even more challenging verses from the Bible about what God expects with regards to holiness from his people. Hebrews 12, 14 says, seek to live a clean and holy life for those who are not holy, will not see the Lord. And 1 John chapter 3, verse 9 says, Those who have been born into God's family do not sin, because God's life is in them. So they can't keep on sinning, because they have been born of God. So God's prevenient grace draws us to him. God's justifying grace forgives us and sets aside our sin. However, God doesn't want us to remain in sin. And so his sanctifying grace heals our sin and leads us to become holy. God's sanctifying grace through the Holy Spirit can perfect us in love in this lifetime. 
This is a distinctive thing that, that Methodists bring to the Christian family. We understand that, that even after we become Christians, we will still be tempted. I mean, Jesus was tempted. He was perfect, but he was tempted, right? The devil came to him in the wilderness and tempted him three times. Didn't mean he sinned, but he was tempted, and we will be tempted too. But unlike Jesus, who was perfect, we still make mistakes. We mess up from time to time. Even if we don't mean to, we make mistakes because we are broken people. Our brains are broken. Our spirits and emotions are broken. And our physical bodies are broken. We will never have perfect knowledge in this lifetime. And no matter how smart you are, the more I know about the Bible, the more I know about God, the more I realize I don't know. It doesn't get better it's, it's just, it makes me more aware. And the, 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 the more um, righteous, I guess you say, I become, the more I realize how unrighteous I am. You understand? We'll never be perfect in knowledge, but there is something we can be perfect in love. We can be perfect in love. John Wesley, the, who founded our Methodist movement, taught that perfect love is when everything you do is motivated by sincere love. And this is our goal as Christians. Even though we know we're going we're gonna to mess up, we're going you know, to say the wrong thing, or we're going to forget someone's name when we need to remember it. I sent a, a, a card to someone one time to encourage them. They were going through a difficult thing. And somehow the wrong address got put on the card and it got sent somewhere else to someone else. But I didn't know. I thought the card had gone to the right person. So that person didn't receive a card for a long time. Um, and I didn't know until about a month later, the person that got the card said, hey, you, you sent a card to me. It was supposed to go to so-and-so. And so that was a mistake. No ill intention, just you know, a dumb pastor doing a dumb thing, <laughs> making a mistake. Um, but the motive was right. And I think that, and I'm a long way from perfection. I've got a lot of flaws and God's got a lot of work to do in me, but I'm aiming for that perfect love. I know I'm never going to always get everybody's name right, um, but I, I can, I believe the Holy Spirit can help me to get to where a place where even when, I'm, when I do something stupid or wrong or make a mistake, it was motivated by love. And I'm hoping to get there one day. That's what we're aiming for. Strive for perfect love. Let God change you. Don't be lazy about that and don't sell out and give up. Because God wants more for you and for me than mediocrity. He wants us to be holy. And we can be holy because God's sanctifying grace can heal us and make us holy. Eventually, Lord willing, everything we do can be motivated by love, but we can't sit back and make the excuse, oh, we're just human. Nobody's perfect. See, that kind of thinking won't get you anywhere. It becomes a crutch. It becomes an excuse that allows you to settle for less than what God wants for you. But, but God's healing grace wants to and can take you all the way to perfection and love if you will let him take you there. And so, true Methodist doctrine shouts holy sanctification loud and clear. It motivates us to be changed and to help change the world. Some Christians live their lives as if they're just waiting to die. They say, you know, well, I've been saved. I've even been baptized. I know I'm going to heaven. What else do I have to worry about? And that's an attitude where we settle for less than what God wants. There's so much more than just being saved. There's so much more.
than just having your fire insurance for hell. God wants more. We're not just waiting to die. What do we pray almost every Sunday when we say the Lord's Prayer? We say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, where? On earth. On earth, as it is in heaven. This is our prayer. Don't you believe that God answers prayers? So that's a possibility. That's our hope. I mean, that's the Lord's prayer that we adopted. Why wouldn't God answer that prayer? It's not God's will that you continue to be dominated by sin. God wants you to actually be free. Does that seem impossible? Jesus reminded us of something about impossibilities. He said in Mark 10, 27, he said, with men it is impossible, but not with God. All, nothing is, nothing is impossible with God. And Jude chapter 1 verse 24 says, all glory to God who is able to keep you from stumbling. We cannot free ourselves or stop ourselves from sinning on our own. We can't do it. But God through the Holy Spirit helps and sanctifies us to grow and become more and more and more like Jesus. We ought to pray for and hope for and cooperate with the Holy Spirit, trusting that God will heal us. If you aren't aiming for perfection, what are you aiming for? And if you aren't aiming for perfection, what do you think you're going to get? Some people think, well, that's just too much to carry. That's just too much of a burden, but it's not. It's not a burden because we don't do it, not on our own strength. It's not a matter of willpower. It's not about buckling down extra hard and gritting our teeth and making ourselves better people. Sanctification is a matter of cooperation. God makes the change in your life but you've got to cooperate. God is a wonderful physician. He is the great physician, but you've got to follow his treatment plan. Are you? Are you actively praying? Are you reading your Bible and spending time in God's word? Are you celebrating the sacraments regularly? Are you coming to be are you surrounding yourself with the family of Christ who encourages you and holds you accountable? Are you supporting God's mission financially with a cheerful heart? Are you devoting yourself to service and love, loving others as God calls you to do? Are you devoting yourself to the Lord God above all else? And of course, the Christian faith is not just a personal thing. Yes, it's a personal relationship with you and God, but it's also a social thing. We are called, as the way they put it in the old Methodist traditions, is we're called to spread scriptural holiness across the land. What does that mean? It means that we're called to help change the world, to make it a better place. Christians have been working to change the world and make it better for the last 2,000 years. Is the world a better place because Christians have been in it? I dare say yes, it is. Yes, indeed. If it hadn't have been for the Christians who have lived in this world for the last 2,000 years, who knows where we would be? We've advanced so many ways and done so many things and experienced so many blessings. We take them for granted because we forget they even come from our Christian faith and our ancestors. And it's not God's will that our world continues to be broken or that Christians would throw up their hands in resignation as we do so many times and we say, there's nothing we can do about it. 
True Christians have worked to make the world a better place. Always have. Even Christians who were being brutally tortured and executed for their faith followed Christ's example of sacrificial love and sought the welfare and the salvation of the very people who were persecuting and killing them. And this is not just something that happened in the past. We forget because we live in America and we're so blessed. We forget that there are Christians around the world right now in 2022 who face persecution and suffer and even die because of their faith. And yet they're still working to make the world a better place. Surely Christians today in our 21st century America can work to make our world better too. But it won't happen if we just throw our hands up in the air and say, what's the point? Why even try? There's nothing we can do. And it won't happen unless we take seriously God's call to be holy people. And it cannot happen just because you, by your sheer willpower, resolve that you're going to make the world a better place. It can only happen by the power of God, through his Holy Spirit, as he moves through us. We cannot do it by our own strength. It takes the supernatural power of God to be transformed and to transform our world. But this is who we are. This is our identity. And God strengthens us for our purpose. One of the special ways that God empowers us is through the sacrament of Holy Communion. In this meal, we believe, and we especially emphasize it in, in our tradition, that this is not just a memorial meal where we remember what Christ did 2,000 years ago with his disciples. That's part of it. But we believe that this is a, a means of God's grace. That through this sacrament, God is pouring out his spiritual help for us to help us find the strength that we need and the motivation to be changed and to help change the world. That's why we often read in Scripture that when the disciples would celebrate Holy Communion, the Lord opened their eyes and they had new insights, new strength. When they were huddling in fear and then they had communion and then they were going out boldly because something had changed in them. What changed? It was that God's grace was poured into their life. Just like he poured it, that grace into their life, he can pour it into us as we celebrate this sacrament here today. On the night that Christ was betrayed, he shared one last meal with his disciples. This was a special way because he, he knew that he was facing something, some terrible suffering, and he knew that it, not only would he suffer, but that his flock would suffer too. That they would all be afraid, that they would be hurt, that they would be sad, they would be devastated. And they were going to need something to help them. And so on that night, he had one last meal with them. And at that meal, he took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body that is given for you. Likewise, after the meal, he took a cup of wine. And he raised it to heaven and asked the Lord to bless it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and drink from this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many. For the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you for sending your son Christ, who left the glory of heaven 
to come and live in our broken world. He didn't come as a conquering king. He came as a humble servant. He was born in a manger. He humbled himself to be raised by two mortal parents. Then he, though he was perfect, he walked this earth and he gathered around him people who who trusted him and were, were willing to follow him and listen to his teaching and obey his commandments and to seek to try to live as he was living. His love was unconditional. Even though people rejected him and spat upon him and hurled curses at his name, and in the end they even nailed him to a cross, he willingly endured that suffering to make a way for us to be at one with you again. And so as we celebrate this sacrament of Holy Communion, we seek your grace for our lives today. Lord, you know exactly what each and every one of us individually needs. We pray that your Holy Spirit would fill us and help us with your divine sanctifying grace. So we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on this bread and this wine that the bread might be the body of Christ and the wine might be his blood, and that we, the people, might be the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. We pray it in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.